Hello, knowledge seekers. In this episode of 20 Minute Books, we delve into the riveting realm of mine by Michael A. Heller and James Salzman. Unveiling the covert laws of ownership shaping our lives, mine is a journey through the everyday battles over who controls what and why. From the priority queues at the happiest place on earth to the contentious overhead bins of aircraft, this book exposes ownership as a social construct, a system of rules that we often take for granted yet unconsciously obey. Distinguished authors, Heller and Salzman are mavericks in the world of ownership rights. Heller graces Columbia Law School as the Lawrence A. Wien, professor of real estate law and has previously penned The Gridlock Economy. Salzman holds the esteemed title of Donald Bren, distinguished professor of environmental law, with a dual appointment at UCLA School of Law and UCSB Bren School of Environmental Science and Management, and is also the author of Drinking Water. Mine is a must-read if you're intrigued by the interplay of law, economics, and everyday life, akin to the insights found in Freakonomics or Nudge. Law students will uncover invaluable perspectives on property rights and pop culture enthusiasts will find a treasure trove of anecdotes illuminating the unspoken guidelines by which we navigate our world. Get ready to claim ownership of the knowledge within mine in just 20 minutes. Mine. How the Hidden Rules of Ownership Control Our Lives. Introduction. Unlock the Secret Language of Possessions. How Ownership Defines Our Lives. When tiny voices exclaim, mine, over a squabble for a plaything, there's something profound unfolding. It's not just a scuffle for entertainment. It's a miniature battle of narratives over who owns what. The concept of ownership entwines itself in every aspect of our lives, from the shows we stream to the words of famous speeches we quote. But navigating the labyrinth of ownership is like trying to hold water in our hands, constantly shifting and notoriously slippery. Those with abundant resources often mold the rules of ownership to their advantage. As this elusive game evolves, there's a curious divergence between physical ownership and the sentimental sense of possession. This metamorphosis draws light to six foundational arguments human beings deploy to define what's theirs. Join me as we explore this intricate dance of possession, where we learn about a surprising tax haven that rivals Europe's financial enclaves, the fascinating legal notion of claiming property through prolonged squatting in Colorado, and the airborne conundrum. When you recline your airplane seat, who really controls the space behind you? Part 1. Navigating the Invisible Currents of Ownership Design Picture yourself amid a sea of stationary cars, yearning for the liberty of the almost empty carpool lane. Or imagine the pulsing throngs at the boarding gate, where a premium ticket lets others glide onto the plane with ease. These scenarios aren't random, they're carefully crafted by the invisible hand of ownership design a concept steering us through everyday choices, masterminded by businesses and policymakers to guide our actions regarding limited resources. The real kicker is the choice that ownership design presents. It's a subtle ultimatum. Either you make the choice or someone is making it for you. Here's the takeaway. Ownership design acts as a subtle director of our everyday decisions and behaviors. Let's dip into the example of borrowing a friend's HBO account. Technically, you're on a piracy adventure that could land you in hot water. Yet the media giant HBO seems to turn a blind eye. Why? It's not due to a lack of resources to chase down every password pirate. No. Instead, it's a deliberate decision. One that's all about owning the future. HBO is betting that today's freeloading streamers will become tomorrow's loyal subscribers. That's the magic of ownership design, simplicity wrapped in strategic foresight. But sometimes ownership design weaves a more intricate web, as in the case of a unique tradition known as the Duke Campout. Once a year, graduate students at Duke University 
transform the perimeter of their basketball stadium into a makeshift village, complete with sleeping bags and recreational vehicles. They inhabit this village over a weekend, all for a chance at courtside season tickets, a cherished commodity amongst Duke's basketball enthusiasts. Beyond just doling out tickets, the campout forges a memorable experience, fostering future philanthropy among students. What's more, the students who emerge victorious from this odds-defying lottery aren't fair-weather fans. They're the devoted, face-painted, cheer-bellowing supporters whose enthusiasm amplifies Duke's image nationwide. The design of ownership here isn't just assigning seats, it's engineering school spirit and brand loyalty, all with a clever twist. Part two, the unexpected twist in the queue. When first isn't always foremost, picture the scene, the iconic steps of the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., buzzing with anticipation for a landmark hearing. The public gallery seats are free. On the surface, it's a democratic first-come, first-served system. People arrive at the crack of dawn, prepared to camp out and claim a spot. Yet, as the doors prepare to open, a peculiar switcheroo occurs. The weary night owls at the front trade places with fresh-faced newcomers who never touch the pavement. This switch is powered by the line-standing industry, where individuals earn minimum wage to hold spots for affluent clients, who in turn can pay a hefty sum for the privilege. Sure, it sounds like a loophole exploited by deep pockets, but then again, it offers a lifeline of employment for the less fortunate. If we were to dismiss the practice of professional queuing, we would also strip away the livelihood of many. Let's grapple with this. The principle of being first in line doesn't guarantee you'll be the first to reap the benefits. Disney World grappled with its own queuing conundrum in the 1990s, long lines and short tempers. With ride capacity fixed, they had to innovate to appease visitors and simultaneously make a profit. Enter FastPass Plus, Disney's magical solution that allows visitors to pre-book ride slots. Guests now had the freedom to meander and, incidentally, spend more through the park before their scheduled thrill. But waiting in line at Disney isn't just a test of patience. It's also a test of wallet thickness. The private VIP tour is the ultimate line-skipping luxury, whisking groups through side doors and past envious stairs, provided you can spring for the $3,000 to $5,000 fee. Now here's the trick. Disney could lower the VIP fee, allowing more guests to bypass lines and bolstering profits even more. But then they'd trade in customer satisfaction for a quick buck, risking the ire of the many for the convenience of the few. Instead, by maintaining a high cost of entry, Disney sustains an illusion of fairness, the perception that everyone has an equal shot at a ride on Space Mountain, regardless of their economic standing. Part 3. The thin line between possession and ownership in our everyday lives. Take a stroll through the fabric of daily life and you'll undoubtedly encounter a myriad of unspoken ownership claims. From the jacket draped over a cinema seat to the official badge marking a handicapped parking spot, we operate within a complex tapestry of possession signals that are ingrained in our psyche. Land ownership, in particular, has been an incendiary issue throughout history, prompting wars and territorial upheaval. Contemplate, for instance, why Native Americans today can't reclaim territories lost during the turbulent times of the Indian Removal Act. The stark reality resides in the legal concept of adverse possession, the idea that prolonged use of land can eventually grant ownership, a statute that has grounded itself firmly in American jurisprudence over a span of 170 years. Here's something to ponder. The belongings you consider yours might not truly be under your ownership. Delving into a more recent tale. In the 1980s, the Curlins of Boulder, Colorado, purchased a sizable plot of land for their golden years. Their neighborly pair, Richard McLean and Edie Stevens, treated a slice of this land as their own, entertaining and intervening without restraint. In 2007, these neighbors lodged a claim for the land. Shockingly, 
Colorado law sided with the open use of the land, stating that after 18 years of continual occupancy, trespassers can forge ownership. The Curlins found themselves entangled in a legal maze, ultimately surrendering a fraction of their land to the adverse possessors. This law makes one thing abundantly clear. Ownership can be an elusive beast. Even our digital possessions, the things we buy online, may reside on shaky ground. Consider the ebooks you download on a Kindle. When you click buy, you envision that the tale is yours, lock, stock and barrel. However, what you've actually secured is a precarious license. Amazon retains the power to unsheathe those digital novels from your device whenever they choose, just as stunned readers discovered when 1984, the Orwellian classic, vanished from their screens over copyright disputes. This intricate dance between perceived and actual ownership underscores a deepening confusion in today's digital and physical landscape, reminding us that what we own and what we merely think we own can be worlds apart. Part 4. Harvesting the Fruits of Another's Labour A Complex Tale of Ownership and Creation From a young age, we're ingrained with the idea that our efforts will be rewarded. You reap what you sow, as the saying goes. This link between labour and ownership has tightly woven itself into the fabric of American history, notably encapsulated in the Homestead Act, which bestowed land upon those willing to invest, sweat and toil into its development. Yet from its inception, the Act carved out exclusions, as seen in the Supreme Court's stance that Native Americans' traditional uses of land held no claim to ownership. The colonial narrative dictated a very particular kind of labor that conferred ownership. Time may have passed, and laws may have evolved, yet the labor ownership axis is still a hot topic in today's discourse. Let's dissect this. People often harvest the benefits from the efforts of others. In the realm of creative work, the law draws curious distinctions. Music enjoys copyright protection, guarding the rights of its creators diligently. However, in the fashion industry, the tables turn. Designs are free for the taking. The fast fashion powerhouse Zara can mimic Balenciaga's high-end footwear at a fraction of the price without a legal hiccup. The fashion industry's plea for legal protection of their craft hits a wall every time. Congress has yet to be swayed that copycat designs cause significant detriment. In this sphere, the labor of designers seems to bear fruit for everyone but themselves. Fashion designers may struggle to secure their creations under copyright, but in other creative contexts, ownership claims can extend to astonishing lengths. The iconic I Have a Dream speech by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a bastion of the civil rights movement, fell under the wing of a profit-chasing company overseen by King's son, Dexter. The cost to license this foundational speech stands so steep that it even eclipsed Hollywood's reach. The film Selma had to navigate around this by using alternative rhetoric. Dexter King capitalizes on his father's profound societal impact, a maneuver that doesn't go unnoticed by contemporaneous civil rights figures or King's other descendants. Thus, we're faced with the quandary of ownership over intellectual efforts and its implications for legacy, profit, and the perception of the value of labor across society. Part 5. Ownership by Attachment. The Ever-Shifting Landscape of Possession. Homeowners often inventory the tangible parameters of their property, but few contemplate the ownership of less tangible assets, such as the volume of air above their foundations. Harking back to a medieval tenet, one might claim dominion from the depths of the earth to the expanses of the sky. This maxim encapsulates the concept of attachment, intuitively pronouncing that ownership extends to all appendages of a possession. However, as society evolved alongside burgeoning technologies, so too did these age-old notions. A century ago, the courts decreed that the airspace above your home was not in fact yours, a pivotal ruling ensuring the aviation industry's liftoff. Yet contradiction abounds. 
and modernity muddies the waters further, especially in the era of drones. In an age where Amazon and UPS foretell a future of doorstep drone deliveries, a legal squabble in Kentucky leaned on the side of a homeowner's airspace sovereignty, casting a shadow of doubt on the viability of this cargo-carrying future. Here's a crucial point to mull over. Claims of attachment are not the be-all and end-all of ownership. Take, for example, the enigmatic space behind your reclinable airplane seat. Lengthy limbs might argue for personal territory, warding off the creeping backrest. Meanwhile, recliners might assert their right to a recline, believing the domain of the seat extends to its rearmost capacity. Here, we venture into a nebulous zone where aerial etiquette is a battlefield and ownership debates hit turbulence. The fluidity of territorial attachment surfaces starkly along Florida's coastline. Linda Cherry once reveled in her private beachfront, guaranteed by local distinctions between dry and public sandy expanses. However, environmental shifts have led to drastic beachfront restorations, funded by state coffers. When the sands shifted, so did the ownership. With new beach land falling into public hands, Linda's stretch of coastal claim was swept away with the tide. This tale of possession and its ramifications underscores the pivotal yet intricate relationship between ownership and the threads that bind it to our tangible and intangible assets. Part 6. Navigating the Legal Labyrinth of Bodily Ownership The human body, a vessel so personal and intimate, raising the quintessential question, who truly owns it? For generations, our physical form has been revered, held apart from the transactional nature of commodities like appliances or vehicles. But enter the modern age, where medical marvels open up avenues of possibility and the boundary of body ownership blurs. At the heart of this complexity lies the reality that, particularly within the United States, our autonomy over bodily transactions is bound by legal codes. Here's a piercing fact. American law establishes strict parameters around which body parts you may or may not sell. Consider the contrasting provisions across states. In selected locales of Nevada, one's virginity is on the market, while a state over, the very notion verges on criminality. Bone marrow may fetch a price in Montana, but cross into Wyoming, and the transaction is forbidden. Globally, the sale of kidneys is universally illegal, save for a singular deviation. Iran. Our anatomy typically includes a pair of kidneys, while we need only one to flourish. Generous individuals may donate a kidney, extolled as a heroic gift, but voluntary donations lag behind the dire need. In the United States, tens of thousands succumb annually due to the dearth of available organs. Yet in Iran, where a regulated kidney market exists, the wait list of death hovers at zero. Why, then, is the sale of kidneys taboo elsewhere? Arguably, the crux of the issue twines around safeguarding the marginalized from exploitation and upholding a collective ethical stance that rebuffs a price tag on parts of our very being. Detractors of organ trading stress the importance of human dignity, asserting that certain elements of our existence defy commercialization. Nonetheless, Imagine a hypothetical future where kidney sales are stringently governed to avert misuse. Should a person straining under financial burdens not have the prerogative to auction a kidney rather than endure grueling, perilous labor? And wouldn't society benefit if lives were saved, sans the harrowing weight? Ultimately, such a moral and legal quandary rests with individual judgment and societal consensus. Part 7 the enduring impact of ownership, when inheritance meets the law. The tale of siblings, Arthur and Mildred and their tussle over a cherished family rocking chair, epitomizes the complexities that arise around ownership in the wake of death. Their quarrel over who deserved the heirloom sparked a legal decision that mandated a seemingly childish solution, alternating custody of the chair every six months. 
It's a clear illustration of how fiercely we cling to the idea that possessions are rightfully ours through familial ties. Here's an insight to ponder. Even beyond the reaches of life, ownership dictates the destiny of your assets. You're likely familiar with the term trust fund kid. Beneficiaries of wealth held and cared for by a neutral entity. Yet, the inner workings of trusts hark back to 17th century England, where the crown implemented the rule against perpetuities to prevent an overconcentration of wealth that could threaten its power. Fast forward to the 20th century, and South Dakota's renegade governor, William Janklow, saw fit to dismantle this ancient restriction, leaving the way open for the creation of dynasty trusts in the state. What unfolded was an attractive proposition for the super-rich, an eternal guard over wealth with a side of generous tax avoidance. Additionally, South Dakota law assured that trust funds were safe from creditors' grasp and shrouded in secrecy. By 2020, South Dakota's trust industry was thriving, boasting over $350 billion in assets, attracting international tycoons and nefarious wealth alike. It's an uncomfortable reality that the privileged can sustain their opulence while skirting the consequences of extravagance. However, the power to design your legacy through an estate plan isn't solely reserved for the wealthy. It's crucial for anyone, particularly parents of minors, to establish a will outlining guardianship and inheritance intentions. Crafting an estate plan is taking the reins of ownership rules, aligning them to your wishes. Hesitate, and you'll cede the reins to state laws, which then become the final arbiter of your worldly belongings. Final summary. Ownership is a concept woven into the very framework of society, dictated by a set of rules, often governed by those wielding power and resources. As times change, so do these rules, disrupting age-old conventions and reshaping our understanding of who gets what and why. It's a kaleidoscope of principles. The age-old mantra of first come, first served no longer holds the weight it once did, and even the bonds of attachment, be they to land, objects, or personal space, are subject to challenge. Our labor presents another quandary. We pour our efforts into our creations only to find that the act of creation itself doesn't guarantee us control over the outcome. Even our bodies, always considered sacrosanct, are now caught in the crosshairs of legal debates concerning what can and cannot be commodified. Death, the inevitable horizon for all, does not end the conversation about ownership. Here, too, laws and regulations step in to exert influence ensuring that our assets continue to engage with the world in predetermined ways, informed by the decisions we make, or fail to make, in life. Understanding the complex and ever-evolving rules of ownership grants us a clearer lens through which to view our interactions, both trivial and profound. It allows us to navigate with greater awareness, and perhaps even bend these rules to our favor within the bounds of legality and morality. Thank you for joining me today on this journey of learning and discovery as we explored the insights of another thought-provoking book in our growing library of knowledge. If you've enjoyed our time together, please take a moment to follow our podcast, give us a five-star rating, and share 20-minute books with other knowledge seekers. Your support truly means a lot. Don't forget to join me again in the next episode, where we will delve into another enriching book. Until then. Happy reading and happy listening.